Blessed are those who hear the word of Yah and keep it. I find out who I am in the page contained herein. This is my Bible. Got a few more minutes of morning, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, I have not done a full-on controversial message in a long time. Sure, I knew I'd get an amen on that one. Uh, but, because I don't want to do controversy just for controversy's sake. I like to teach people something, even though y'all are here, TikTokers say it later on, and then act like it's the first time you ever heard it. Maybe my delivery's too dry, or maybe it's too much at once. Maybe I talk too fast or talk too slow, I don't know what it is. But we're going to get some controversy today. So here we go. We have an election coming up in two days. The, you know what the best part about the election being in two days is? It's over two days. Yeah, no. The best thing is we don't got to see those ads no more. You don't got to get those mailers no more. Kamala will stop texting you. <laughs> um... Because I'm tired of the ads. I'm like, I don't even know who this person is. I'm tired of hearing about abortion. And it's like, whoever wins, it sounds like the world is going to be doom and gloom if you listen to the ad that you're listening to. She's going to open the border. Trump tax. $4,000 to the average American family. <laughs> right. No exceptions. <laughs> so I love to follow politics in real life. Now, it's not because I'm a political nerd. Uh, it's not because of who my father is, because there's five other kids that got the same father, and they don't follow it the same way. I love to follow politics because it's the best, it's the most entertaining thing on TV. Because I'm an apolitical person. I don't consider myself on either side. I think both sides have some good things, and then both sides have some insane things, too. But it's truly theater. A common thing that you will hear your favorite politician at the end of their speech, they'll say, God bless America. And we'll talk about how this political system is theater later on. But they'll say at the end, God bless America. And there's even a song. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but the question is, will God bless America? Would any of our prophets that we follow in scripture, any of our ancestors, would they say, God bless Babylon? Did the apostle Paul, while well, he was writing his letters in the New Testament, did he ever say, God bless Rome? Right. No, because why would they ask the Most High to bless the oppressing country? Now, you may say, for all these patriots out here, you might say, we don't live in an oppressive country. I've got news for you. My news is, have you watched the news? If you watch those political ads, it sounds like we are living in the worst country in the world, or we will be living in the worst country in the world if a certain person gets elected. So it sounds like an oppressive country if we just look at the ads, right? As my son was saying, Dad, we can't vote for so-and-so because they have the borders and they're killing people. I said, you know those are ads, right? It definitely sounds oppressive if we listen to one side, talk about the other side, does it not? They are trying to quiet certain voices on both sides. There's both sides where they want certain people not to talk. Oh, this person's too crazy far right. This person's too crazy far left. This person's just crazy, crazy. Again, that sounds like oppression to me. Sunday, today, before an election, 
But anytime there's an election going on, whether it's for your local mayor or senator, the, and I told you guys this was going to be controversial, right? Because the first slide is about to get into it. And this next sentence is too. Because on the Sunday, before election Tuesday, Democrats will go to the black church and act like that's how they get down. They'll be clapping off, beating everything. Like they go there all the time. They ain't seen inside of the black church until it's election time. When it's not election year, they can't find a black church. Election cycle's going on, they in every single one. But they have always used the black church to control the black people. Like, when Planned Parenthood was starting, do you know who they gave the first Margaret Sanger Award to? Does anybody know? Not Diana Ross. It was Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I'm not making a political statement. I am stating a fact. I'm not saying if Planned Parenthood is good or bad. I'm a political. But I'm telling you for a fact that politicians use the black church to control black people. Now, I'm not, am I saying black church is bad? Heavens, no. Just telling you a fact. If you disagree, I'm sorry, we can have our own opinions, but we can't have our own facts. Planned Parenthood knew that they would need the black church to buy into this new program as they are put in predominantly inner city neighborhoods. Again, just stating a fact that people love to use the black church. Let's continue. The politicians know that if they can get the black church, they can get the black community. But that's another lesson, though. We're not, I'm not stopping there. That was just a little, just to show you how crazy it's going to get today. Good crazy. Let's look at scripture, though, because I know Pastor Cheryl is like, is that boy going to open up the word? I don't want to, <laughs> we just ain't going to get posted. The four square folks not going to like this. <laughs> now, this is one of my favorite stories in scripture. We're going to go to Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man, somebody say a man, a man. standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander... Of the army of Yah, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does Yah have for his servant? The commander of Yah's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, depending on if you got a good Bible or a fancy one for a better translation, verse 14 doesn't say the word neither. It says the word no. He's like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not part of this. But I'm here. And that's all you need to know. Sometimes we need to tell our problems that. No, but the one I serve is here. And that's all you need to know. Now this is not an angel. What is this? It's a man. Somebody jumped ahead. They were looking through my notes. Because I emailed it to them. <laughs> and then we know that this is, as, as Brother Pierce said, we know this is the Theophany, which means this is our Messiah before he was born of Mary. We know that this is him because when Joshua bowed and gave reverence, he accepted it. Because an angel would say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> back up. <laughs> And it says he saw a man. And Joshua bowed and, he, and the man accepted the reverence. And then he said that he is the commander of Yah's army. In Revelation 19, it tells us the writer whose name, what is the writer's name in Revelation 19? 
So if these Bible scholars would know, living word, the word of Yah. Come on now. So we got to go back to basics, Pastor. We can't go deep. We got to go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 1, we'll turn to there, please. <laughs> in Revelation 19, it tells us that the writer whose name is the word of Yah tells us in ch chapter 19, verse 14, that the army follows him. And we know who that writer is, correct? Yeah. And then in Joshua here, he says, I'm the commander. What do people do? They follow the commander. This is the same person in Joshua chapter 5. That's in Revelation chapter 19, which is our Messiah. Are we following along? Yeah. So it's clear who this is. And Joshua asked our Messiah, are you for us? Yah's chosen people, the ones who struggled with God, Israel, or against us? And our Messiah's answer was no. It doesn't get any greater than the Israelites, does it not, according to Scripture, right? This is what it's all about from the beginning to end. It's constantly about Israel. And when the Messiah is asked, are you on our side or the enemy's side? The Messiah answered, no. The Messiah said, I'm above your border war. I am above your political affiliation. So we, if we ask this man a different question than Joshua asked, are you a Republican or a Democrat? No. Are you conservative or liberal? No. We try to turn our faith political. We argue our political stance way more than we argue our faith stance. People will stop talking to family members because they voted for somebody. But they'll let them serve another God. They won't say nothing. And again, in our faith, we believe that if you are not following the Son and following the Father, what's going to happen to you in the next life? Right. Which is a lot worse than, oh, I voted for so-and-so. But we'll argue that. And if we want to be real, there's not too much that happens different depending on who we vote for. I know the political ass say like things are going to be heaven or hell depending on who you vote for. But on Wednesday, my life's going to be the same. And on January 21st, whoever gets sworn in, my life's going to continue the same because I follow someone who sits on the throne, not 1600 Pennsylvania Drive or Avenue, whatever it is. <laughs> right. I'm not going there. Voting is our civic duty. It is not our religious duty. Now, a huge thing that we say in the church when it comes to voting, because we are always voting for such flawed men and women, and neither party truly reconciles to our faith, right? We will say that we are voting for the lesser of two evils. People will say that all the time. Well, they're both bad, but I got to vote for the lesser of two evils. Does that sound like something our Father in Heaven would want us to do? Nope. Do you think our Father in Heaven wants us to choose evil or lesser evil? People will say we have to vote based off of our biblical values. They say this when they are speaking about voting conservatively and about the issue of abortion. But we have to vote conservative because we can't, we cannot vote for killing babies. Am I the only one that's heard that? All right, just making sure. But this collection of 66 books that we call the Bible, it speaks more than just about abortion, right? It speaks more than about, quote unquote, killing babies, right? It also talks about helping the poor. Helping the immigrant, forgiving debts, 
Because one side, when they tried to forgive some debts, they took the dude to court. You're how dare you forgive debts that we don't want to forgive. Well, scripture says we should. I thought this was biblical values. Or was it only sometimes biblical values? Oh, okay. Consistently inconsistent. But I guess our Republican Party, our conservative party, I should say, only read the part about don't kill babies. They didn't read the rest of it. Because they are blatantly against the other principles and values that our faith mentions. Or am I wrong? And the people thinking, because whenever you talk about your team, that's the, that's the only thing that people will register. When I was talking about Democrats, this brother, what's this brother up here talking about? Then when I talk about Republicans, what is this dude? Oh, I can't believe it. Thought he was smart. Thought he was one of the good ones. But this isn't about Republicans. And, and when I'm talking about right now, about how the Republicans do not reconcile to our faith, it's not about what about isms. I don't have to talk about the Democratic Party not reconciling to our faith because they don't pretend and act like they are the Christian Party. So I don't have to say that they don't like that. And I'm not putting them down and putting them higher. One side tries to say we're Christians, but their fruit doesn't reconcile to that. One side doesn't try to say we're Christians over here. They already said, don't think that that's us over here. Uh, at the Democratic convention, and this isn't a conspiracy theory, so I watched this live. In 2012, there was a huge argument and a lot of boos that came on the crowd when the Democrats tried to put, have their platform put the name of God into it. And when they voted for it, everybody booed and said, no, we don't want that. And the crowd's literally saying, no, we don't want God in our platform. But they had already, it was already part of the script for them to adopt that. So then it was a guy named Mayor De La Rosa, and he's like, it's decided. And the crowd's like, we're all saying no, why would you do that? So again, one side tries to lie and say they're Christians, but don't do Christian things. One side isn't trying to pretend. They're like, be what you want to do. I know I lost some people, but it's okay. And to be clear, just stating facts that neither party should get your vote based off of your faith. That's all that I'm saying, is that you can't say, I'm a Christian, so I have to vote Republican. I'm a Christian, I have to vote Democrat. Vote for whatever you feel would make your life better. Because it's your civic duty, not your religious duty. But keep the most high out of it. Because his answer was, no. But again, one side is KFC. One side is Popeye's. Now, I know it's going to get some of y'all hungry. But the thing is, we're the chickens, and they both want to fry us. Right wing, left wing, one bird. Because ain't no successful birds out here with one wing. The wings act in unison. Now I'm going to show you. I talked about political theater earlier. Back in the time of when Obama was president, every time Obama would make a State of the Union, there was a Speaker of the House named John Boehner. And I'm sure Pastor Cheryl is like, I thought we were going to the Bible. We'll get back there, trust me. Now, John Boehner was the Speaker of the House, and he was a Republican, and he would go on and on about how Obama was wrong and how and everything that he said was wrong. And, like, during the speech, I have a picture of it, during the speech while Obama was talking, John Boehner would look, and he would have the worst face in the world, and he would just be mean-mugging Barack Obama the entire time. And he would say mean things about him all the time afterwards. He'd have a response to it and poke out all the lies that he thought Obama said all the time. And they're like, we don't want this guy to win another election. He's not good. He's, he's the worst pers president we've ever had. All the negative things, right? We know how they do on TV, correct? Not making this up. So a few years later, and again, this was him every time he was in the presence of Obama. 
A few years later, Speaker Boehner retired. Then, in 2016, Obama's term was up, and he was about to leave office. And then he had this skit about retiring, and he says, I don't know what I'm going to do when I retire. I need to uh, ask someone how retirement is like. And you can look this up. And then they made did a whole video. It's like four minutes. Of them laughing and joking and going on to the movies and going out to eat, laughing and hee-haw and kee Now, when the cameras are on, they're mortal enemies. Camera goes off, they're buddies. And then you, I, I, this was shocking because it's like, you hate, you mean mug this guy in front of the entire nation while he's giving a speech for eight, for six years. But then, chilling. I would not hang out with someone like this if they were disrespecting me unless it was part of the plan. Because right wing and left wing act in unison. Bird can't fly with only one. But in our families, in our households, and at work, we are arguing and disowning people based off the political affiliations while they are friends when the cameras go off. But again, K- KFC or Popeyes, they both want to fry you. I will show you proof that both sides Truly, at the end of the day, they care about power, they care about your vote, but they don't care about you. I'm going to show you a fact as to how. Whether you're black, white, rich, poor, they do not care. They care about power, because that's what politicians do. You'd be a bad politician if you didn't care about power, right? Now, there's a common saying that everybody has heard, I'm sure, And everybody knows. The saying is that they take third grade test scores to figure out how many prisons they will have to build and maintain. Is the people anyone else ever heard that before? Just making sure so people don't think I'm making it up. This is common knowledge. But the fact that this is known and no one does anything about it shows that they both want to fry you. Because the fact that it is known. Then instead of investing money into said third grade so that those schools improve the test scores, they will rather wait until these grown-up failure third graders commit a violent crime and need to be housed. Because if you knew that people that did horrible in third grade became violent criminals, which means they murder someone, rape someone, kill someone, uh, rob, like all of these different things that get you in prison, like not a misdemeanor, felonies, they know this for a fact. Studies have been done. Millions of dollars have been invested to study this. And so that shows they don't care about those third graders that are failing. They also don't care about who those people are hurting. Because this third grader could go kill a rich person. This black person that's a third grade could grow up and kill a white person. They don't care about either person, right? Because if all this study's been done, they'd rather pay for the prison which is a billion dollar industry, then invest, they'd rather give the billions in profit than invest the millions so that those third graders don't grow up to be criminals. Both sides want to fry you. The politicians would rather pay for prison meals. No, they used to say three hots and a cot. They would rather pay for prison meals more than they would like to pay for school lunches. Because that's a big thing that they're arguing about this election cycle is who's going to pay for the school lunch? Who's paying for the war in Ukraine? Who's paying for the war in Israel? The lunch costs a lot less than the missiles we're donating or giving. We can't. How dare those children eat lunch? Oh, you want to bomb somebody? Here you go. Well, we'd rather pay for third graders to die in another country than to eat in this country. Sounds like oppression to me. Remember I said we live in an oppressive country? What country would choose that for their citizens? Exactly. 
And I'm going to prove it once more that both sides want to fry you. There was a governor in California a year, decades ago, and they later became president. But while they were governor, they were on record saying that the most dangerous thing in America, I'm not trying to be this pacifist, please say dangerous, most dangerous thing in America. The most dangerous thing in America. The most dangerous thing in America was the free breakfast program. Because, and this was in Oakland, California. They, he said that it was so dangerous, there's no bigger threat than the free breakfast program in Oakland, California. Because if these inner city children were properly nutritioned, they would go to school and do well on those third grade tests. And then they would mess up the entire program. And billions of dollars are generated through this program. You're, we're either going to pay for school lunches or prison meals. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Our politicians, and again, on both sides, show that they are fine with the billion-dollar prison industry because both sides want to fry you. They invest in private prisons where young black teenagers literally get sold by judges to prisons. You can Google that as well. There's been judges that have been caught doing that, and they're selling people that should get a misdemeanor, but giving them felony prison state, uh, sentences, and they're getting thousands of dollars directly sent to them for sending these children to prison. No one stood up and, and stopped this. On both, No Republican stopped it, no Democrat has stopped it. They allow this to continue on. No, just sit there and play in our face. Stop trying to figure out how to cast your ballot, but figure out how to read your Bible. Because y'all said that I got to figure out how I've got to vote on Proposition 2. <laughs> what is, is, and they word it crazy on purpose because they want the people that they ain't paying attention to part put yes instead of no. Do you want the train to go to the southwest by the north and the for the commission and the millage? <laughs> yes, I think. And then the other thing that happens, <laughs> no Pastor Charlotte, is, where's the Bible at? <laughs> I, I believe me, we will open it one, once more. <laughs> it's actually twice. But then they try to make the election racial and use it to divide the race, races, the ethnic groups. Trump has a plan for black people. Kamala has a plan for black people. First they say Kamala doesn't have a plan. She doesn't, she, she's not even saying she's got a plan. Then she came out with one. Oh, she's just pandering to get votes. <laughs> can't have, can't win on either side. Then they'll say, well, when Trump was in office, he provided funding for HBCUs. Well, that was Congress, because like we know who paid attention and didn't pay attention in social studies class. And then, speaking of KFC and Popeyes, people will say any black person that is rooting for the Republican Party because they're black is like the chicken rooting for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> but any black person that's rooting for the Democratic Party because they're black it's like the chicken rooting for Popeyes because they have a black woman as the president. Allegedly, she's not really the president, but just on the commercials, she's the president. <laughs> Both sides want to fry you. You're going to go to the white guy or the black woman. I can't make this up. Again, vote for whoever you want to vote for, but don't make this about your faith. Don't make this about your ethnicity. We need to recognize what is in front of us. Now I have a great passage that we are going to read and see how foolish we are by not recognizing the principalities, the rulers, and the authorities that Paul said that our battle is against. We're too busy arguing with our coworker, arguing with our family members about these politicians, but Paul said, you don't argue with them. That's your fight is not against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against your cousin. Your fight is not against your wife or your husband. It's against the rulers. 
So I may need to read Ephesians. Now I know we've been light on scripture today, but we have been heavy on facts. Amen. So let's look at this story. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. They went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So this guy has a problem, right? He, he, he can't get right. Verse 6. When he, who's he? Oh, no, no. Man. The man. When the man that had a problem, when can't get right, saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice. He's screaming. What do you want with me? Jesus, son of the Most High, Yah. in Yah's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. When Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. So in this story, who recognized who? Right, the man with the problem recognized our Messiah. Now follow me here, okay? I know we got some cute kids in here. We all like, oh, look at her. Oh, look what he said. And we got to put our thinking caps on, as they used to say back in the day, because I'm going somewhere with this. And then for past, you past sure definitely got to pay this because we're in the Bible now. Legion and Jesus met each other before, right? Can we follow that? We know that because the man saw Jesus from, from a distance and then ran up to him and said, called him by name. Legion and Jesus do not look the same that they looked before they met, though, right? Because Jesus probably has some characteristics of his mother. Looks like one of the people in that region at the time. The Legion is possessing another person. That's not even his true self. He's inside of someone else. So are we following? They met each other before, but they looked differently to each other before. But Legion recognized Jesus in the spirit in fear. Jesus didn't recognize Legion. Because Jesus said, what's your name, bro? Because legion isn't important to Jesus. But Jesus is the most important to legion. Because he knows that there's a certain time where Jesus is going to torture him. Because he said, it ain't time yet. We still got a few thousand years, bro. You early. Are we following? They recognize each other. Or they, they met each other before. Legion recognized them and said, you're early. It's not time yet. But, again, legion is not important to Jesus. I'm going to break this down. My father, when he worked secularly, he managed hundreds of people. He used to say it all the time when he was yelling at Kirsten, how many people he managed. How many people did you manage at your height, Pastor? He said 900, because he, whenever he's yelling at Chris, I manage blah, 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 people. You're going to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, when people see me, especially when I, we work for the same company, they would ask me about my dad, and they would tell me stories about him. But one day, I was at work, and this was not when we worked at the same company, I was at somewhere else. And this guy said that he used to work at Spartan in the warehouse. So I always ask people that used to work at Spartan in the warehouse if they know my dad, just so I can see their reaction. 
Because usually and some of them have like negative colorful stories to tell them. I just have to sit there like, you know, I can fight you, right? <laughs> so I asked this gentleman if he knew my father. His face lit up when he discovered who my father was. He said that my father was so instrumental in his life. He said I would be in his office and he would talk me through things and then I was going through a horrible divorce and he really helped me out. Like he was so important to my life. So after work, I asked him, I said, do you remember, and I said his name, I don't remember it. I said, do you remember so-and-so? He said, you are a huge part of your life. Do you know what Pastor said? No. I have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Our pastor was paramount and integral in this guy's life. But this guy was not vitally important in, in Pastor's life. So obviously in this guy's story... <laughs> Pastor has his own chapter. It's not mentioned in Pastor's story. Because our pastor had a bigger job. He had 900 people's stories that he was listening to and that he had to manage and take care of. Well, let's get back to Mr. Legion. Hopefully you caught that metaphor that I did there or that or why one person can remember one and one other can't. People will say that Legion was maybe a thousand demons inside of this man. But Legion is a measurement that is in Roman and Gro excuse me, Roman and Greek uh, language that can mean up to 6,000. So we have no idea exactly how many. But by his own words, he said, there's a lot of us in here. We deep in here. <laughs> but let's just look at many. And then... We're gonna, I want you to remember that Mr. Legion saw our Messiah from afar and recognized him. Can we hold on to just that part? Yeah. All right. So let's look at some church folk real quick. Matthew chapter 12, 22 through 24. Then they, the Pharisees, brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So the Pharisees saw a miracle here, right? Because nobody else healed this man of this problem. That's why they brought this guy to Jesus to see if they could do it, right? We following? And what was their reaction? They turned into Bobby Boucher's mom from Waterboy, the devil. They saw a miracle, and their reaction was the devil. Right. Mark 5, verse 6, let's go back to that, says, When Legion saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell in front of him and shot his voice. He recognized Jesus from a distance just walking around. The Pharisees saw Jesus perform a miracle, and they said, the devil. The Pharisees and Sadducees spent all day at church, and they didn't recognize him. So the man that was possessed by a thousand demons recognized Jesus, but the men that possessed a thousand scriptures did not. See, y'all too busy looking around and so y'all missed that. The man that was possessed by a thousand demons recognized Jesus from a distance, but the men that had a thousand scriptures memorized couldn't recognize our Messiah after they saw him do a miracle. Like James, the little brother of Jesus said, even the demons believe in Yah, and they shudder. So believing in him is not enough. Because the Pharisees believed in Yah, and they saw his son and said, the devil. After they saw him do a miracle nobody else could do. But the demon fell down. These Pharisees should have fell down and bowed down. They should have acted the same way as this impure man did. These demons have the necessary fear, but we do not. Because the beginning of wisdom is the fear of Yah. These demons are more wise than us. 
I, I think that that deserves its own stoppage right there. There's no reason why the demon should have a higher ranking than us as far as being wise because they're the ones that went against the throne. They have the, rec the, the necessary fear. We do not. How much sense does that make? That's like you've been at your job for five years and then a new hire comes in and starts outperforming you in the first week. What sense does that make? Now, when these demon-possessed people are asking for your vote on Tuesday, <laughs> they definitely got to be possessed by something because they're not following in our Messiah's footsteps. If we judge them by their fruit, right. right? I'm just telling you what the Bible says to judge by the fruit because I know people say only God can judge. No, the Bible says we're supposed to judge people by the fruit all the time. We're not supposed to judge the tree. We're supposed to judge the fruit. The fruit is bad. So when these demon-possessed people ask you to cast your vote on Tuesday, remember it is your civic duty to vote, not your religious duty. We need to recognize our Messiah, and we need to recognize the devil. Thank you, Father, for a blessing to the reading of the word.